It's day 11 of our Bible reading plan. We're reading Genesis chapter 16, Genesis chapter 17, verse 1 to verse 14, First Chronicles chapter 12, John chapter 5, verse 19 to verse 29, James chapter 5, verse 7 to verse 12, Psalms chapter 11. We'll start with Genesis chapter 16. Now, Abraham's wife, Sarai, had born him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Agar. So Sarai said to Abraham, Look now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go to my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarai. So after he had lived in Canaan for ten years, his wife Sarai took an Egyptian maidservant, Agar, and gave her to Abram to be his wife. And he slept with Agar, and she conceived. But when Agar realized that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be upon you. I delivered my servant into your hands, and ever since she saw that she was pregnant, she has treated me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. Here, said Abraham, your servant is in your hands. Do whatever you want with her. Then Sarai treated Agar so harshly that she fled from her. Now, the angel of the Lord found Agar by a spring of water in the desert, the spring along the road to shore. Hagar, servant of Sarai, he said, Where have you come from, and where are you going? I am running away from my mistress, Sarai, she replied. So the angel of the Lord told her, Return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then the angel added, I will greatly multiply your offspring, so that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord proceeded, Behold, you have conceived and will bear a son, and you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your cry of affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. He will live in hostility toward all his brothers. So Agar gave this name to the Lord who had spoken to her, You are the God who sees me. For she said, Here I have seen the one who sees me. Therefore the well was called Bealahairoi. It is located between Kadesh and Beret. And Agar bore Abraham a son, and Abraham gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abraham was 86 years old when Agar bore Ishmael to him. Three things struck me here. The first is how Sarai recommended or advised Abraham to take Agar as a wife so that she could have children through her. And Abraham agreed. But at the end of the day, when Agar started to despise her mistress, Sarai put the blame on Abraham. What was Abraham supposed to do for crying out loud? That shows us that we take responsibility for our actions and decisions, regardless of who advised us, regardless of what made us to make that decision. So we have to think through whatever actions, whatever decisions we're going to make, consider the consequences and even the unintended consequences that may arise from it. And know that, yes, we decided to do it and we are going to bear the consequences. We see the same thing at play in the heavy part of Genesis where Adam blamed his action on his wife. Oh, it is the wife who gave me that gave me the fruit and I hate. And Eve in turn also blamed her action on the serpent. So it was the serpent that you know, deceived me and I hate. But at the end of the day, they all bore the consequences of their actions. So even when people are advising you, know that you are still going to bear the consequences of your actions. And when you are advising people also, uh, realize that they will bear the consequences of 
you know, the actions that they take. And sometimes they may lay the blame on you that, oh, you are the one that advised them. So <laughs> you have to be wise in giving advice. I give advice a lot before. But now I'm learning not to give advice. I just point out options to people, except those that are very close to me, and maybe um, we have a covenant relationship, so to say, okay, or you know, uh, I can't advise, but of course you still have the prerogative to determine what to do. But generally, it's best not to advise people. Generally, it's best not to advise people. Give them their options, okay, and let them make up their minds or ask them questions. And that's one thing that coaches do. As a good coach, you need to be able to ask the right kind of questions. Okay, you are asking questions, they are answering the questions. In the process of answering the questions, they find their own answers. Everybody has answers to their situations, they have answers to their issues. You can just help them to draw it out. The Bible says that counsel in the heart of a man is as deep waters. A man of understanding will draw it out. So even if you're a counselor, your real job is not to give advice. Your job is to help people draw out the counsel that is already on their inside. And you do that by listening, by you know being empathetic, you enter into their situation, you have compassion for them, you ask the right questions, and in the process, you'll be amazed how the Holy Spirit will work in you and through you and bring out the answers that they need. Even you, the counselor, or the coach, or the teacher, you will learn in the process. You don't have all the answers. Okay, God has the answers, and those answers are on the inside of the people you are even dealing with. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, and God says that I will write my law in their hearts. You understand? So you are just drawing out that counsel from their own spirit and also from your own spirit. So don't um, fall into the trap of, okay, always giving advice, always giving advice. Okay, so in summary, again, whatever actions and decisions we take, regardless of who advised us or who we advised or whatever circumstances surround it, we are going to bear the consequences. And people can also blame us, okay? They can blame their actions on us. So we have to be careful, okay, how we navigate our lives, how we navigate situations and circumstances in such a way that our good will not be evil spoken of so that we can also remain blameless before God and man as much as it depends on us. That's the first thing. Now, the second thing that struck me was how Aga left because she was being maltreated and the angel of the Lord appeared to her and told her to go back. Now, eventually, we're going to see it. She still had to leave, but at that time, she was not the one that left by herself. She was asked to leave. Many times, the situations we're trying to escape from, they are designed to build our character. They are designed to help us build capacity in certain areas. And when the time is right, God himself will open up the opportunity for us to move to the next level. But many times, we want to move before it is time. I remember in my situation, for example, and a lot of people face this kind of situation. You say, oh, I want to start my own business. I want to pay my own boss. By the way, I always advise people, if the reason you want to start a business is that you want to be your own boss, you have missed it from the beginning. It shouldn't be about being your own boss. It should be about having an opportunity to serve at a greater level, having an opportunity to maximize your potential, knowing that, yes, this is what you should be doing. And it's not just about starting a business. It applies to every other move. For example, example, you want to leave a job and pivot into another career, or maybe even in the same career, you want to move to another organization. All of those kind of decisions should be made wisely and also with counsel from God. Okay, you see what the Bible has to say to you in that particular situation. You listen to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit on your insight. You consider all factors before you make the move. You need to know that the time is right. The third thing is how an angel appeared to Aga and she said, oh, you are the Lord who sees me. From that experience, I believe that she was probably surprised that oh, in this situation where everyone had rejected me, okay, God is still mindful of me. And then he sees me in this situation and he has reached out to encourage me, to help me, to give me insight and direction. In the same way, regardless of what we're feeling like, regardless of how tough the situation is, you have not been forgotten by God. God never forgets us. He says that if a sparrow will not fall without God knowing, don't we know that God has counted every strand of hair on our heads? 
That is how much God cares about us. This is not theory, it's practical, it's the truth. Believe it and you are going to see it in reality. So, Agar saw that, that God truly cared about her. And she called, okay, God, who the God who sees me. And you know, she, she practically built an altar around that experience. Okay? And that is what we also should do. At every point in time where God has manifested to us, where we have surmounted a challenge that we thought would probably put us under, where you know God has shown himself mighty on our behalf. We shouldn't just gloss over it. We should thank God. Maybe God delivered you from an accident. Maybe you were about to lose your job and God intervened. Maybe you know you were delivered in childbirth. You know, you 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 came out you know, successfully, whatever it is. Maybe you finished uh, your course of study. All those things are not you know, something to be taken for granted. Any success that you have achieved in life, give God glory, okay? Build an altar around it. When I say build an altar around it, I mean make it a memorable experience and a point of praise and thanksgiving to God perpetually. So that over time when we face similar situations or we confront other challenges, we remember what God has done in the past and we give him praise for that, we give him worship for that. And based on that, we know that it's also going to come true for us in the situation we're confronting at the moment. That's what David did when he was alone, you know, keeping his father's sheep in the wilderness, fighting off the bear, fighting off the lion. He built an altar around that experience. So when he faced Goliath, he was like, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? I am going to take him down the same way I took down the lion and took down the bear. So it's important that we do not forget the goodness of God in every situation. We know that God sees us and we appreciate his goodness and we take that in as an asset that we bring to every situation that we're going to face subsequently in life. Let's read the next passage, Genesis chapter 17, verse 1 to verse 14. I'm not going to comment on this, I'll just read. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abraham fell face down, and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abraham, but your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will descend from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And to you and your descendants, I will give the land where you are residing, all the land of Canaan, as an eternal possession, and I will be their God. God also said to Abraham, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants, in the generations after you. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, which you are to keep. Every male among you must be circumcised. You are to circumcise the flesh of your first king, and this will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Generation after generation, every male must be circumcised when he is eight days old, including those born in your household and those purchased from a foreigner, even those who are not your offspring. Whether they are born in your household or purchased, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh will be an everlasting covenant. But if any male is not circumcised, he will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now let's read First Chronicles chapter 12. Now, these were the men who came to David at Ziklag, while he was still banished from the presence of Saul, son of Kish. They were among the mighty men who helped him in battle. They were hatchers using both the right and left hands to sling stones and shoot arrows, and they were Saul's kinsmen from Benjamin. Ahazah the chief and Joash, who were the sons of Shema the Gibeathite, 
Jezel and Pellet, the sons of Azmabeth, Beraka, Jehudi, and Apotite, Ishmahiah, the Gibeonite, a mighty man among the thirty, and a leader over the thirty, Jeremiah, Jahaziel, Johanan, and Josabat the Gederathite, Heluzai, Jeremoth, Bealiah, Shemariah, and Shephatiah the Arufite, Elkanah, Ishiah, Azarel, Joheza, and Jashubim, who were Korahites, and Johela and Zebadiah, the sons of Jeroham from Gedor. Some Gadites defected to David at his stronghold in the desert. They were mighty men of valor, trained for battle, experts with the shield and spear, whose faces were like the faces of lions, and who were as swift as gazelles on the mountains. Ezra the chief, Obadiah the second in command, Eliab the third, Mishmana the fourth, Jeremiah the fifth, Atai the sixth, Eliel the seventh, Johanna the eighth, Elzabad the ninth, Jeremiah the tenth, and Machbanai the eleventh. These Gadites were army commanders, the least of whom was a match for a hundred, and the greatest for a thousand. These are the ones who crossed the Jordan in the first month when it was overflowing all its banks, and they put to flight all those in the valleys, both to the east and to the west. Other Benjamites and some men from Judah also came to David in his stronghold, and David went out to meet them, saying, If you have come to me in peace to help me, my heart will be united with you. But if you have come to betray me to my enemies, when my hands are free of violence, may the God of our fathers see it and judge you. Then the Spirit came upon Hamasai, the chief of the thirty, and he said, We are yours, O David, we are with you, O son of Jesse. Peace, peace to you, and peace to your helpers, for your God helps you. So David received them and made them leaders of his troops. Some from Manasseh defected to David when he went with the Philistines to fight against Saul. They did not help the Philistines because the Philistine rulers consulted and sent David away, saying, It will cost us our heads if he defects to his master, Saul. When David went to Ziklag, these men of Manasseh defected to him, Adna, Josabad, Jediahel, Michael, Josabad, Elihu and Zilethi, chiefs of thousands in Manasseh. They helped David against the raiders, for they were all mighty men of valor and commanders in the army. For at that time, men came to David day after day to help him until he had a great army like the army of God. Now, these are the numbers of men armed for battle who came to David at Hebron to turn Saul's kingdom over to him in accordance with the word of the Lord. From Judah, 6,800 armed troops bearing shields and spears. From Simeon, 7,100 mighty men of valor ready for battle. From Levi, 4,600 including Jehoiada, leader of the house of Aaron, with 3,700 men, and Zadok, a mighty young man of valor, with 22 commanders from his own family, from Benjamin, the kinsman of Saul, 3,000, most of whom had remained loyal to the house of Saul up to that time, from Ephraim, 20,800 mighty men of valor, famous among their own clans, from the half-tribe of Manasseh, 18,000 designated by name to come and make David king. From Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. 200 chiefs with all their kinsmen at their command. From Zebulon, 50,000 fit for service, trained for battle with all kinds of weapons of war, who with one purpose were devoted to David. From Naphtali, 1,000 commanders, accompanied by 37,000 men, 
with shield and spear from Dan 28,600 prepared for battle from Hasha 40,000 fit for service prepared for battle and from east of the Jordan from Ruben, Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh there 120,000 armed with every kind of weapon of war all these men of war arrayed for battle came to Hebron fully determined to make David king over all Israel and all the rest of the Israelites were of one mind to make David king. They spent three days there eating and drinking with David but their relatives had provided for them and their neighbors from as far as Issachar, Zebulon and Naphtali came bringing food on donkeys, camels, mules and oxen, abundant supplies of flour fig cakes and raisin cakes, wine and oil, oxen and sheep. Indeed, there was joy in Israel. We all are going to need people to help us. We're going to need helpers that will connect us to the next phases of our lives. That's the way God has designed it so that nobody can boast. But the truth of the matter is that it is God that sends those helpers when we are running Elter Skelter, we want people to join our team, we want people to help us. We are going to be downgrading ourselves in ways that we probably may not even realize. Eventually, we may get the help that we seek, but that help will be substandard and it will come at great cost. But when we stay in our stronghold and let God send helpers to us, we look up to God. That's why David, very soon, spiritual man. He, he said, I will look up to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So we should look up to God and let God send us the helpers that we need. Good talent is scarce, especially if you are building a business and you want people to work with you. But do you see how the best of the best came to David? Read their profiles, look at their CVs. They were the best of the best. And some of them were from the competition. Okay, they were from the household of Saul, you know, and they came with their own weapons. David did not give them anything, David did not have anything to he even told them that see if you come to you know betray me, may God judge you and all of that. And they said, See, we have come, God has sent us to help you, and they were devoted to him. We also can get people like that, but what we should do is to stay in our stronghold. Maybe God has called you to start a ministry, for example. You don't start looking around, you guiding people. No, you go into your stronghold, you stay there, you are praying, and let God send you people. That is what we see in the Bible. David had been anointed, but he didn't go and you know, seize the throne or anything. He was there in the cave of Hadulam. Then at some point he was in Hebron, but he was in his stronghold. In the same way, we also should stay in our stronghold until God sends people to us. Whether it is starting a business, whether it is getting married, whether it is raising a family, whether it is getting a job, whatever it is. Of course, we're going to be making moves, we're going to be taking steps, but those steps should be as directed by the Spirit based on the instructions we have received while staying in our stronghold. They should not just be action done you know, in the flesh. Whether it is men that you need, whether it is means, whether it is material, we look up to God. We don't run after people. Okay, then God sends all that we need to us. And if we're in a waiting period, stay in your stronghold like David did. We also see the same example with Saul, who we now call Paul, Apostle Paul. After his encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he was blind for a few days, then God sent Ananias to pray for him that he may receive his sight. Then after that, we learned that he went away for three years, locked himself up. I think it's in Arabia or Damascus. I don't remember right now, but we can check that from the Bible. But he went away for three years. He was just there, nobody heard of him. He was studying, he was preparing himself, he was praying, okay, until the time came. The same thing with Joseph. He was in prison. He was, you no. Know, uh, Potiphar's house prison and all of that until his word came. So we all have to wait until that. And even Moses, he was taking care of his father in law's sheep until okay, the time came and God sent him. When he stepped out before time, he, he created problems. Okay, so in the same way, we must understand God's timing, okay, and step out in accordance with God's timing. And we must also wait for God to send us the resources that we need the people, the talent, the materials, everything that we need. We must stay in our stronghold and let God send them to us instead of us, you know, jumping up and down, running out of skelter, trying to make things work on our own. Let's read the next passage. 
John chapter 5, verse 19 to 29. So Jesus replied, Truly, truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself unless he sees the Father doing it. For whatever the Father does, the Son also does. The Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. And to your amazement, he will show him even greater works than this. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he wishes. Furthermore, the Father judges no one, but has assigned all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son, does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment. Indeed, he has crossed over from death to life. Truly, truly, I tell you, the hour is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so also he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this. For the hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Let's think about that. Consider the fact that Jesus Christ also said that as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Also consider the fact that the Bible says that as he is talking about Jesus Christ, as he is, so are we in this world. Now consider those in the scriptures and think upon these things that we just read in the light of those other scriptures. Now let's read James chapter 5, verse 7 to verse 12. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer awaits the precious fruit of the soil. How patient he is for the fall and spring rains. You too, be patient and strengthen your heart because the Lord's coming is near. Do not complain about one another, brothers, so that you will not be charged. Look, the judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in affliction, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. See how blessed we consider those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen the outcome from the Lord. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or earth or by any other hope. Simply let your yes be yes and your no no, so that you will not fall under judgment. Now, let's read the final passage for today. That is Psalms chapter 11. In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, play like a bear to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrow on the string to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. His eyes are watching closely. They examine the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. His soul hates the lover of violence. On the wicked, he will rain down fiery coals and sulfur. A scorching wind will be their portion. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for insight. We thank you for inspiration. We thank you for guidance that we have received and that we will continue to receive. We thank you because the Holy Spirit is brooding over these words and we bring them to our remembrance right to when we need them in the name of Jesus. Thank you because your word will guide us. Your word will give us wisdom will give us direction and will empower us, equip us for all that you have called us to do. Thank you, Lord, because your word goes ahead of us to make crooked paths straight 
in the name of Jesus. Your word abides in us, and by this we bring forth fruits. Your word gives us an inheritance among them that are sanctified. We have more understanding even than our teachers because we meditate on your testimonies in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, because you've answered our prayers. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Have a great day. Bye for now.